Hey, I want to pray, and we're going to move right into the teaching of the Word of God in just one second. We'll pray, and we'll, we'll, we'll teach the Word of God, and uh, I'm excited that you're here. Come on, let's pray and welcome God's presence. Father, we thank you today that you're here. We thank you that your blessing's here. We thank you that your help is here. And Father, I thank you that you would help us see exactly who we are. We thank you that we have kingdom rights, and we're going to operate in those kingdom rights and our responsibilities as well. And we're going to go and grow as a people in Jesus' mighty name. And the church said, amen. All right, I want to ask you a question out there. If you guys are going to pass those, you can go ahead and pass those at this time, those cards. Go ahead, feel free to pass them. I want to ask you a question, uh, those of you that are out there, and you say, you take some and just pass them right down the row, okay? Um, here's, here's what I want to ask you. How many of you out there are born again, you've called on Jesus uh, as your Savior, as your Messiah? Let me see your hand if you, if you say, yeah, I'm born again, I'm a Christian. All right, you can say this out loud then. I want you to say this out loud. Say, I am a child of God. Come on, let's say it again. I am a child of God. Let, let's say this. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. All right, you have an inheritance and you are a child of of the Most High King if you've called on the name of Jesus for salvation. And so now that you're a son and a daughter of God, you're a kingdom kid, there's no greater kingdom to be a part of. The Bible says you've been brought out of darkness and brought into marvelous light. So now that you're a kingdom kid, you have kingdom rights. You have rights that have been given to you as a citizen of heaven, as a child of God. You don't have to just let life happen to you anymore. Come on, life's not happening to us. We're happening to life. We're born again. We take dominion. We walk in authority. We're different than we were before we got born again. If you believe that, say amen. We have rights, man. And uh, here's the deal. With rights also comes responsibilities. How many believe that? If you've been given rights and you're not responsible with those rights, what happens in a culture, happens in the world, is eventually you start losing the benefit of many of those rights. See, a lot of our culture, we love our teaching about rights. Come on, I got rights, man. I'm an American. You can't push on my rights, you know. Sometimes I'll get that way getting on an airplane when they're herding me around like cattle. You can't do that. I got rights. I sit where I want, you know. Uh, that's the way our culture thinks. But Jesus didn't just say we have rights. We also have responsibilities. Jesse taught about this out here a couple of weeks ago. If you're a, a, a child of God, you have an inheritance. Do you know this? In the ancient Near East, if we were born into a father's house, and let's say the father has five sons in the days of the Bible, once he died, that child would have an inheritance. And that inheritance wouldn't just be divided five ways. All right, there's five sons. That inheritance would be in, uh, divided six ways now. So you got five sons, but you have six portions. Why would you have six portions? You would have six portions because the eldest son gets a double portion of the father's inheritance. Here's what I believe about us as Christians. I believe that we are eldest sons and we get not just one portion, but we get a double portion of the father's inheritance. Think about how blessed we are to be sitting in this room living in America. Is anybody thankful you live in one of the most prosperous countries in the planet? You ought to give God a hand clap for his grace and his mercy right now. Somebody say amen to that. It's so mind-blowing when you start going to the rest of the world and seeing how the rest of humanity lives. Did you know this? If you make forty-three or 44000 a year annual household income, twenty-one or 22000 a person if you have two wage earners, you now are a part of the top 1% of earners on the planet. Man, we are a blessed people. We've been given a double portion, so to speak, if you compare it globally to the rest of humanity. And I'll tell you what, I think the blessing comes to bless us. God wants to bless you. He wants to lift you and help you and take care of you and provide for you. But he also wants you to be a blessing to somebody else. What is the double portion for? What is the more for? It's to be blessed and also to be a blessing. You know, I heard a story about a couple of guys that were stranded on an island a while ago. They were out boating and having a big time, and their boats malfunction, and they get lost, and finally they, they're, they're running out of any way to navigate. They shipwreck, and they land on an island. And one of the guys there, you probably have a guy like this in your family or, or somebody like this in your family. They freak out no matter what is happening. They lose their mind, right? The news gets bad. The economy drops. They lose their mind. Uh, there's a snowstorm coming. They're, they're facing booking like it's the apocalypse, they lose their mind. Don't 
point at anybody, but you know the kind of personality. Can you imagine what it would be like to be stranded on a desert island with such a person? And uh, the other guy's on the desert island, and he's, he's cool as a cucumber. He's laid back. He's hanging out. He's putting together his hut, you know. He's getting his Wilson so he can talk to him later like Tom Hanks in Castaway. And the other guy's like, why are you not losing your mind? We're on a desert island. He said, man, I'm a millionaire. You don't have to worry about this. I got all kinds of money. You'll be fine. The guy's like, listen, your money won't spend on a desert island. But he says, no, no, you, you, don't, you don't, don't freak out, man. I'm, I'm a millionaire. You're all right. And the other guy's like, you're crazy. Your money won't spend. What do you mean you're a millionaire? We're on a desert island. And the third time the guy says, listen, don't worry about it. I'm a millionaire. I make 300000 a month and I pay my tithe. My pastor is going to find us. You will be all right. See? See, I'm telling you, uh, I believe this. I believe if you're the kind of person that will realize what the more is for. And you won't just be about your rights, but also about your responsibilities. That the Father in heaven and the Spirit of God will search over heaven and earth. He'll look over every crack, every crevice, every part of the earth, and he will find a way to lift you up and to bless you and to help you and to dust you off and to get you in the path God has for your life. Come on. We're not just people who have rights. We have responsibilities, and we're going to live in them. Somebody give God a hand clap. Do you believe that? We got rights. We got responsibilities, amen? It's the way it goes. I want you to open up your Bible, and I want to show you one of the major responsibilities that we flow in as a church or we're called to. And that's in Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30. Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30. And this sets up a theme that runs all throughout the Word of God. Here's what it says. It says this, it talks about giving. Lucky you, you showed up on the week, the preacher is talking about giving. Everybody say yay. All right, I know you're fired up. Uh, here's what it says. It says this. It says a tithe of everything from the land. Everybody say everything. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy. A tithe of everything from the land. Whether from the grain, whether from the fruit, no matter where it's from, one-tenth of everything from the land is set apart as holy unto the Lord. See, God gives this principle of the tithe or of the tenth. It's his way of financing the church and the gospel and all sorts of benevolence things we do to go around the world. And it was established, this comes out of the law of Moses. Whenever Israel is uh, taken out of Egyptian bondage, they now become a nation. And how many know a nation has to have a law unless it's just going to be lawlessness? And so God inspired Moses to preach to the people and to put it in the law that there would be a tithe. See, he found it not just from law, but it was a principle all the way back from the book of beginnings, from the book of Genesis. You'll find Abraham in the very beginning. Abraham is the prototype of the faith man. He's the guy who started the nation of Israel, one of the most blessed group of peoples on the earth. And Abraham himself paid tithe to a guy by the name of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a priest and a king over a city called Salem. Now it's known as Jerusalem. And I'm telling you, the New Testament says that Melchizedek was a shadow and a type of a Christ that would come. Moses picks it up, puts it in the law. A tithe of everything is to be cut off. And brought to the Lord. You know, after the law, Jesus said this when he was fulfilling the law. He's talking to the people of Israel. He said, and he was talking to the Pharisees. And he says this, you pay tithe of herbs and spices and just the smallest little thing. And that you should have done. See, Jesus said, yes, you should pay your tithes. Do you know what? The book of Hebrews says this. That today, whenever we give money to the church or we take care of the house of God, that we're not just putting money in buckets. We're not just sending money to a bank account. It says that Jesus himself receives our giving, blesses it, and breathes on it. Come on, somebody give Jesus a hand clap for overseeing and receiving what somebody like us would bring to somebody like him. It's amazing. So what is a tithe? A tithe is a tenth. Everybody say a tenth. It's really what it means. It's a tenth. If you look up the word tithe that, that's written in the Bible, it means two-tenth, that you cut off a tenth of everything that you get your hands on and you bring it and present it to the Lord. The Bible says that the tithe is already dedicated unto the Lord. It's called holy. 
And the holy things are supposed to be cut off and only used for God's services. And so whenever you take something that belongs to God's service and you keep it for yourself, there are problems attached to that thing. See, you would be so much better to take what it is and to lay it on the altar of God. And then the blessing of God can come on the rest of what you have. The tithe is holy. In, in modern culture now, the word tithe in the Christian church has become synonymous with the word give. Well, people will say, I give 2%, I give 3%. There's no such thing as tithing 2 or 3%. A tithe is a tenth. You know, the stats show now in America that the average Christian gives 2% of their household income to the work of the Lord. They give 2% of their household income. And then if you look and you find what Christians tithe, how many percentage of, of the church uh, born-again Christians in America actually give a tenth of their income. Uh, the, the stats show that about 3% of the American church gives a tenth of their household income to the work of the Lord like the Bible prescribes. Now, think about all of the things we could do. See, now 3% of the church in America is tithing. Think about what could happen if the other 97% of the church by faith would step up and begin to do what the word of the living God says. Think about how many more churches we could build. Think about how many orphans we could feed. Come on, somebody. Think about how many uh, people without clothing we could clothe. Think about the hospitals the church could build around the world. Think about the medical research that could flow from Christian charities and organizations if we had the other 97% of people in the game. A lot of people will say things like this. They'll say things like, well, the church ought to be doing this. The church ought to be feeding the poor. The church ought to be, well, and the question really is, tell me, are you giving to the church so you can empower the church to do the things that you think the church should be doing? Have you gotten in the game yet and fed what is feeding you? I heard Bishop Jakes preach this the other day. He's like the greatest orator in America. And he said this. How many of y'all like his preaching? You ever heard him preach? Man, he's a preaching machine. Probably best preacher in America. He said this. He said, you got to learn to feed what's feeding you. He said, think about this. Like the grass on the earth, whenever it dies, it feeds the soil. And then the nutrients from the grass come back up. The grass comes up, up. The grass feeds the soil, and the soil feeds the grass. The grass is wise enough to feed what is feeding it. Think about a marriage. Whenever you're first trying to catch one another, you're trying to get hooked up, you know, you got the urge to merge, you're single and you're ready to mingle and all that kind of stuff, hot to trot, right? Yeah, I know, uh, Christians got that too. There's nothing wrong with that. Come on, it's God-given. Somebody say amen, as long as it's in the right lane. And uh, you're trying to get hooked up, man. You're looking good. Whenever I tried to catch Jesse, you know, I didn't eat a carb for like one solid year. I didn't touch a carb. I was trimming up. I was sweet to her. I sent flowers. I'd, I'd call her. I would be nice to her and all that. I tell you, I was looking good when we got married. Uh, we, well, I better not even say that. I'll back up. All right, I'm going to get myself in trouble. But best I could look when we got married. You know what happened? I, I, was, trying to, I was trying to catch her. Then we got married. And I gained 30 pounds in like 32 minutes. It was like, bam, just like that. I was drinking 64 ounces. Does anybody remember Surge, the energy drink? I don't know about you, but I like to go fast. Somebody say amen to that. And I was hammering. They had a special on them at the quick uh, trip behind my house. I was hammering like two 32-ounce uh, Surges a day, 64 ounces of pop. It was like the perfect weight-gaining substance. And, and one day I wake up and I look around, and I wasn't doing the things that I was doing to catch her in the past. How I many know oh, you can stop feeding what's feeding you pretty careful if you don't pay attention to it in marriage? Come on, somebody. Me and Jesse were in the car the other day. I have a dog named Pirate. And you know how you make a dog love you? Pretty simple, isn't it? Look at your neighbor and say, feed it. We pull into a gas station. The dog's in the back with the kids. It's late at night. We were driving here. It was Monday night. We drove 15 hours out here to preach to with three children and a dog. I love you. That's all I got to say. I love you, man. And... Uh, I pull up late at night. I'm trying to stay awake. We need gas. Jesse needed a restroom. And I couldn't see him coming, but there was somebody that's obviously messed up that's sneaking up to my window to panhandle me. And I couldn't see him, but the dog's in the back asleep. And the dog feels him coming before I ever feel him. That's what a good dog does. The dog jumps over my back and lunges at the window, ready to fight and bite and go after it. Do you know what that dog was doing? It was feeding what's feeding it. Come on, somebody. 
And it was a person, I love them, but it's a crackhead. When they panhandled me, I'm like, listen, I got crackheads in my own family to give money to. I can't be giving money to you. We got our own crackheads in our house. Come on, somebody. Y'all know what I'm talking about. How many of y'all got a family like my family? You know, you, you relate, right? If I'm giving money to a crackhead, it's going to be my own blood and flesh and blood crackhead. That's who I'm giving my money to. And uh, tell them that sometime and see the response you get out of them. It's, it's a blast. Then I'm like, bless you in Jesus' name. Be warm and filled. All right. Uh, so a tithe of everything. Everybody say it's holy to the Lord. See, so few of us in America have a right relationship with money. See, money is not evil, but a wrong relationship with it will mess your whole life up. The way you flow, the way you operate. It touches almost every part of our life. You know that there's more scripture in the Bible about money than there is about prayer. There's five times more scripture in the Bible about money than there is about prayer. There's five times the scripture in the Bible about money than there is about faith. There are 2,300 verses about money in the Bible. Why did God write so much in this sacred book? By the, day, by the way, it is the day of the Bible. How many are thankful? National Celebration Day of the Bible. Come on, let's give God a hand clap for his word this morning. The Bible is awesome. Why would God, why would God put all that in the Bible? Because he knows that the Bible says this, Jesus taught this, where our treasure is, that's where our heart will go. Wherever you invest your money, your heart follows, right? You, you, you put some money somewhere. Let's say you got some money in the glove box of your car. Now your heart begins to follow. You care about where you park that car, if it's locked, and if the glove box is locked and secure. You buy a stock, put it in your retirement account. You didn't care about that stock, didn't know that stock's name, never looked at that stock. Once you put money in a stock like that, now your heart cares. Where your money goes, your heart follows. Jesus said this, turn over to Malachi chapter 3. I'll show you how he said we can cure the money game and we can take care of the house of the Lord. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. It says this. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. If you're there, go ahead and say, uh-huh, today. It says this. Uh-huh, you're moving. All right. It says this. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. The Bible says this through the prophet Malachi. He speaks to the nation of Israel, and he said, can a person rob God? Is it possible for humanity to rob God or to, or to mug God? And he goes on and he says, yes. He says, you have robbed me. And literally in the Hebrew, it says, you have embezzled from me. You know, here's how embezzlement works. Here's the way it goes. Uh, how many of y'all went to the fair in Amarillo this year? You went out to the fair in Amarillo. God bless, you were so blessed if you didn't have to go to the fair in Amarillo. I got little kids, so I had to do that, you know. And uh, I like paying cash at places like that. I'm kind of old school. I like cash in my pocket. If you didn't have cash in your pocket, my dad would be like, what's wrong with you? Are you in trouble? Do you need, what can I do for you? You need cash some. Now we're almost a cashless society. And you go out to the fair and you try to pay them cash. They don't take it. We don't take your cash. I'm like, is this America? You know, you don't take cash. They're like, no, what you have to do is you have to go buy a card and you have to load it. And then you can pay for rides and pay for food at the fair with the card. Now, why would they have such an, an arrangement? It's because the skim in the fair business, the embezzlement in the business is so high. It could be 10 to 15%, those cash businesses, that people you've hired and employed to handle your money are taking and putting in their pocket when it should go in your purse. They take your money. It's embezzlement. And so at the fair now, they have to have a system to keep humans honest because it's in our nature to skim. He said, will a man rob me? Will a man embezzle from me? He says, yes, you've robbed me in tithes and offerings. And then he says, bring all the tithe into my house. Everybody say, bring all, all right? Let's say it again, bring all. All right, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking for some money in my pocket. Notice he doesn't say give. He says, bring. All right, what I got right here in my hand right now, it's my fold money, and I call it my she money. Now, does anybody know what she money is out there? She money is money that she don't know about. That's what she money is. And all you men, you need some of this. You need some she money. And all the guys said amen, right? So what I'm going to do right now, I'm not giving my she money to Jesse. 
All right? It doesn't say, it doesn't say, it doesn't say give the tithe because the tithe's already his. You just don't know it yet. It's set apart. It's devoted to the Lord. I can't give the tithe. The 10% belongs to him. It's already his. How many know the house that we got up in this morning, it's not ours, it's the Lord's? Come on, somebody. The food we put in our mouth this morning, it's not ours, it's the Lord's. The clothes on your back are not yours, they are the Lord's. And the God that gave you what you have, the Lord could give it, and the Lord could take it away. It all belongs to him. So whenever he calls and he says, I bring a tithe of everything he's given me, and I'm telling you, he's given me so much, I could never get even with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. If he asked for the last penny I had, come on. I remember the Brian that sat on that front row as a free base meth amp junkie, and he came into my life, set me free, got me delivered from drugs, filled me with the Spirit, and gave me a family. Everything I have, it belongs to him. And so I can't give it, I bring it. So, like, I'm going to take my she money, and I'm not giving it to Jesse. I'm bringing it back to her. You know why I'm bringing it back to her? Because I stole it from her purse in the back room before this session because I had no money in my pocket. Come on, it's her money already. Everybody say it's his money, huh? Come on, it's his money, right? It's not my money, it's his money. And if you get that right, you already got rights, now we're talking about responsibilities. Whenever you get your responsibilities right, life starts flourishing. The more responsible I become, the better my life gets. Somebody say amen to that. The less responsible I behave, the worse my life gets. It's just wired into the world. It's there in the book of Proverbs again and again and again. If you'll behave responsibly, God will bless you. And thank God he helps us when we're irresponsible. Come on, let's give God a hand clap for his grace, right? It's like this. So he says this, will a man rob me, yet you have robbed me. Uh, but, but you say, in what way have we robbed you? And he says, in tithes and offerings. He says, he goes on and he says, you're cursed with a curse. Because of this wrong relationship with money, you have a thing that's devoted to God now in your house. And when you have something that doesn't belong in your house, but it belongs in God's house, there's problems attached to it. Some people look at their money and they say, man, I can't afford to give. I can't afford to do that. I wish I could, Pastor, but I just can't. Listen, what you're doing is you're bringing a problem into your house. Right now, you brought a curse into your house when you could bring a blessing into your house. It's not that you can't afford to do it. You can't afford not to do it long term. Think about it like this. If you're God and you're looking at your kids and you're giving them assignments and you're resourcing them to fulfill those assignments, which kids would you want to give more to? The ones that won't do right with what you've given them or the ones that are knocking it out of the ballpark and following your command? See, God is looking for somebody he can flow through. He wants to bless the world. I've heard the story told about tithing and giving for, uh, for a lot of years now. And it, it talks about like a small um, agricultural center in the bread basket. You've seen little towns like this. You pull up into the little town and there's like a granary there. There's probably like an ag co-op there. There's a few churches there and a couple of mom and pop restaurants. Is anybody raised in a town like that? That's all there was there, man. Just this kind of stuff. Farming people live there. And uh, there was a real blessed guy that lived there. He owned the granary. And so smart guy, it's going to be in a grain, grain community, y'all own the granary. Somebody say amen to that. And, and so the church goes to him and he says, they say, listen, the church isn't doing good. And we see that you know how to handle money. If you're going to get money advice, you ought to get money advice from somebody that's got some money. Somebody say amen to that. If you're going to get marriage advice, get marriage advice from somebody that's got a decent marriage. You know, I've got a, a grandpa that's still alive. He's in his 90s. And I kind of look like him. I love him. I'm kind of almost cloned like him in our body type. He's a beautiful, beautiful old man. And uh, I'll just say that glorious creature. Um, and, and he came to me, he's talking to me, me and Jesse just got married, and he says, he says, Brian, I want to tell you something about how to handle Jesse, and I'm like, Grandpa, you know I love you. You're like one of my favorite people on the planet, and I'll listen to you about a racehorse, the racetrack in Henderson, Kentucky, we call it his office. If you want to know where Grandpa's office is, it's at the racetrack, you know, we love him despite his imperfections, and then, and then I say, if you want to talk to me about a cattle deal, I'll listen to you, about buying land, I'll listen to you, about crops, I'll listen to you. But you've been married five times, man. Why in the world would I ever listen to you about a woman, right? And a lot of us have gotten bad advice from the wrong people. And we keep taking it in. We got the wrong relationship with money because we get the bad advice. So this church is smart enough to get the guy that knows what he's doing. And they say, listen, man, will you manage the finances of the church? And he says, I'll tell you what I'll do. 
I'll manage the finances of the church, and I'll do it for one year. But here's the kicker. I get to do it my way. You don't get involved for one year. If I'm in charge, I'm in charge. Nobody looks at what I'm doing. I get it done. And so they agreed to it because he's, he's, a, he's a strong guy. And he starts to manage the money of the church, and the church starts to really get blessed. And the community starts to really get blessed. And like revival hit their little agricultural town. The people made more money. The crops brought more money. The yield was better than it had ever been before. They had a record-breaking year. You know what I'm praying for everybody in this room? I'm praying that you get a record-breaking 2019 that's just like I'm talking about right now. I'm believing that for your life, that God's going to pour you out a blessing where there's not room enough to receive it. And so after a year, they go to him and they say, listen, uh, what's up here? Why, uh, it's, things are going great. They go to him and they say, we're more blessed than we've ever been. The church has had the greatest year of ministry we've ever had. We've won more souls. We've fed more people. we built new buildings. Man, man, what, what's up? What's happened here? The guy looks and he says, well, it's real simple what happened here. I run the granary, and all of you have farms, and you bring your grain to my granary. And so all of you that are part of this church, whenever you brought your grain, which is your livelihood, to my granary, I immediately took 10% of your grain, sold it, and I put the money over in the church's account. Because I've been looking at the books and I saw that you weren't given, so I decided I'd just do it for you because you told me I could bless the place. You know what a lot of people need in life with money? They need somebody else just to take the financial will and to drive it for them. And here's the strongest thing you can do with money. Anything that matters with money, you need to set it once. You make a decision about it once. And then you set it up where you don't have to keep making the same decision. You set it and then forget it. It's the way you should do your retirement in the future. Decide what portion you're going to give, set it up, and forget it. How many know if you've got to make the decision every week to put the money where it goes, you'll never make the decision, will you? But if you set it up to keep going, it's like going to the gym. If I say, man, I'm going to go to the gym whenever I get time, I'll probably find the time in 2027, somewhere around July or August, when business gets slow, Right? Because you got you got to pick a time. It's like, hey, 7 a.m., four days a week, I'm at the gym for 45 minutes. You make that decision once. The decision you make once and set up to keep going is the one you keep. The decision you got to keep making and making and making, it eventually rides you and owns you. Listen, here's what he says. He says, I want you to do this. You bring all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. What a promise. Bring all the tithe to me. See if I won't move in your life. God himself says, try me or test me in this. You know, it's the only place we're ever given the opportunity to test or to try God. You don't test God in any other area, right? You don't want to test somebody more powerful than you. But God shows up and he says, test me or try me now in this and see if I won't act on your behalf. I'm going to tell you if you'll step across the line of faith and you'll do what you're called to do as a Christian. If you try God in this, I'm telling you, God will open up the windows of heaven. He'll pour you out a blessing where there's not room enough to receive it. His word is faithful. There's enough. He's the God of more than enough. You don't have to be afraid of money anymore. Stop fearing the things of this world. It's just paper in your pocket. It's not even reality. It's a carnal world system of keeping score. And it rules so many people's lives. It's like, man, it doesn't rule my life. God rules my life. Here's how you kill that spirit that owns you. Fear of money. You become a giver. Now, that's not the only part of money management and getting ahead in life. But I'll tell you, it'll break a spirit of greed off your life. You start giving. It'll break a spirit of fear off your life. It'll great break a spirit of lack off your life. God will do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think. Why did he say to do it? He said, bring it into my house that there can be ministry or meat in my house. Right? We want to be blessed, but we want to be blessed to be a blessing. Come on, everybody say, blessed to be a blessing. Let's say it again, blessed to be a blessing. One more time, blessed to be a blessing. It's the most powerful thing you could ever do. She so starts stepping up in every area of life and say, hey, God so blessed me. I'm going to be a blessing to somebody else. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to step across the line and to tithe and give today. I've been preaching about this. Now you can respond. 
Right, I'll pitch the ball out there to you out of the Word of God. It's your job to take it and to pitch it now. So uh, this is a, a relationship that moves both ways. The Word of God moves towards you. Now you move towards the Word of God. The person that moves towards the Word of God is the person that gets blessed in life and goes forward. The person that gets the Word pitched to them and sets where they are, they stay where they are. I'm telling you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to prepare a tithe or an offering. Those of you that have never done this, I want you to step across the line of faith and tithe today. You ought to go back to your last paycheck and cut off 10% of it and dedicate it to the house of God. I'm telling you, whenever you do that, God's going to begin to move in your life. It's probably going to freak you out today and scare you. Those of you that are already tithers, you ought to step across the line and give an offering today in response to the Word of God. You ought to do that. You ought to respond to God's Word and God will respond to you. Take care of God's house and God will take care of your house. All right, if you say the account's drained and I can't do it, well, you ought to make a decision today the next time you get paid. That, that money hits your account. You ought to cut off a tithe, put it to the house of God. Why? So there can be meat in God's house. So there can be kids ministry in the back where our children are learning the Beatitudes, learning about Jesus, learning about the goodness of God and the fruit of the Spirit. How many are thankful for that? I'm telling you, the world's always trying to tame our children. We ought to pay to put the house of God, the knowledge of God, and the Word of God in their life. We ought to, we ought to get that radical. It's meat in the house. So right now, you're getting the Word of God. That's meat in the house. The worship, that's meat in the house. The Honduras Crusades, meat in the house. Why can we do that? Because somebody cared about somebody other than themselves. Well, come on, let's get ready to give today. They'll put the ways to give up here. Let's respond to the Word of God. Uh, if I preach about salvation, I'm going to give you a chance to get saved. Preach about healing, I'm going to pray for you to be healed. When we're talking about giving, I'll give you a chance to give and respond. Uh, you can go through the offering envelope you can give today. You can also give through your smartphone on the Victory app. Uh, you can give at evictorychurch.org. If you want to set something up where it's recurring giving, I think that's the decision that makes the most sense. Where you honor God first, you set it up. And uh, I do giving like this. I got it set up where it's going to go. A lot of times I'll set it and forget it. That way I don't forget it. So once you don't have automated, it kind of, I miss it in my life. And I think it's a strong way to take care of any big important issue in your life. You can also give it 806-603-3232. And uh, you can text to that. That's text to give. You know the ways to give. Here's what I'll say. A testimony of giving and tithing. My mother and father were starting a business when they were young. My mother was a Christian. My father was not. And mom was his bookkeeper. And she was given to the church. She was a devout Baptist lady. Dad goes to her and says, listen, you can't give to the church anymore. You're giving too much of my money away. He didn't get it. He wasn't a kingdom man. She said this. She said, listen, I don't know if this is right or wrong. You do the math. But she said, if you're going to rob God, you're going to have to do it by yourself. I'll not be a party to it. So I'm not going to keep your books anymore if you won't let me give. Do what you want to, but I won't, I won't help you. And uh, that was her play. And so dad kept the books for about two months till it drove him crazy, new business, couldn't keep up with it. And finally goes back and he says, listen, give whatever you want to to your church as long as you take the books off of me. I'll, 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 let, you, I'll let you do what you want. Just get this stress off of me. You know what started to happen to his business? The blessing of God came on his business in a supernatural way. Now I really believe to this day it had nothing to do with my father's ability. I believe it had everything to do with the heart of a little lady that wanted to bless the house of God. You know, that business thrived. And then my father passed away. When he passed away, my mother sold that business to a partner. And the moment the tither was pulled out of the equation, it wasn't a couple of years to one of the biggest businesses of its kind in America was gone. It was dust. See, God will bless what blesses him. He'll move in that, in that area. Here's what I want to do. I want to pray over your giving this morning. Man, I'm so thankful that you're here. Thank you for, for allowing me to preach and teach this message to you. Come back next week. I won't, I won't be talking about money next week, all right? I'll be here preaching next week, but it'll be a lot lighter next week, all right? Bring somebody with you. I want to pray over the giving. I'm so glad you're here. Father, I bless this offering now. I thank you for the people under the sound of my voice. I thank you that you blessed us to be a blessing. Let us be a supernatural blessing to your house, to your kids, to to everything that you have around us. Bless us to be a blessing, I pray. In Jesus' mighty name. And the church said amen. Hey, we're going to give now, and we'll, we'll worship together one more song in one moment.